Hey, right, Jason. Welcome to an unboxing for Robo Rally. Um, this is a very interesting game. It is um, this is the current version by Renegade Studios, um, who have done a lot of other games for. Uh, and I say current version because this game came out quite a while ago, um, mid nineties, I believe, uh, early nineties. Uh, originally by Avalon Hill, I believe. And I might not have the exact companies or dates right, but I believe it was about that time. Um, and it was created by Richard Garfield, um, who, if gamers, if that sounds familiar, he's also the man who made Magic the Gathering and uh, Keyforge, one of the newer games, plus a lot of other stuff he's definitely worked on. Um, so then, later on, this eventually got re- uh, remaking like a second edition, I guess you would call it, from Hasbro. There might have been, that might have been a third edition. There might have been a second edition in between there as well. Um, in like the late 90s. And then now Renegade Studios has picked up the Hasbro licensing and they're re-releasing it again. So this is very well a game you might have seen as in your childhood or um, young adulthood, depending on how old you are, I guess. Um, and they're just bringing it back. So... I don't have any of the other versions to compare it to directly. I could have pulled up pictures, I guess. But for the most part, like, the boards and um, the components of the characters and stuff, lots of them look pretty identical. Like, they just recreated what they did. The cards they did change. They updated them a little bit. But they all look fairly much the same. Um, I don't know if... I, I think there are some cards in the older ones that aren't in the newer one, but that doesn't mean they won't come out eventually because they have released expansions for this as well um, to match some of the older expansions. But at the same time, I think they added some new stuff in there as well. So it's very possible that they're going to come up with brand new content, content and some of the other stuff that comes out might bring back some of the older gameplay elements that maybe got missed in some of the other expansions or versions. Um, so yeah, just in case this seems familiar, that's what it is. Um, all right, so what is Robot Rally? It is a, um, programming, you play as a little robot, and you're basically programming your robots to win a race around a factory. Um, and there's various obstacles on getting away. There's, uh, conveyor belts, there's gears, there's charging stations, uh, pitfalls, um, and then later expansions like other stuff like water and teleport and fire. Um, and then you're competing against other robots who are also going to shoot at each other occasionally. Um, but yeah, it's kind of neat because you program, um, you program your, your five moves in advance and then everyone takes a move at the same time. And then as they move across the board, um... Let me see if I can grab one of the boards here. I have everything sitting on top of them. And then as they move each turn, then what one does from the next turn to the next might adjust how it happens. So, like, here's an example of a board. Um, you know, so you're, like, you're moving your little robot along. You get little tiny miniatures like this. Um, and you might, your first move might have your robot. So, if he's facing this way, might have him spend... One step forward, move him on the conveyor belt. At the end of that round, conveyor belt is going to move him. Um, and then his next turn, he might have him turn. And then the next turn, conveyor belt will move him again. And then he might have him move again. And then, so like, landing on different obstacles, different things, might, um, might do different stuff. There could be stuff where, like, you want to move this way, but you can't because... This guy hasn't moved yet. He decided to rotate instead of move. So now he's in your way. So it wastes your turn. Or you might end up pushing him. Which then messes up his entire thing. And there's all these different other things. And you're trying to race to these little checkpoints. Which will be along the maps. Um, along the different parts of the board. So there might be two on this board. There might be three on a different one. Um, there could be like two there. And then five down here. So maybe you have to go two here. Go back to the other board for three. Another board for five. Um, but that's it. It's tiny. It's like the overall concept is fairly basic. Um, and there's double sided boards. So you can get different boards. That different uh, combinations of different areas you have to go to. And this and that. Um, and then every... Every robot gets the exact same deck of cards, which we'll go through a little bit later. So everyone has the exact same set, but 
um, the basic way you play is it is you shuffle out nine of these cards and then you can play them face down and then you flip them up one at a time so the opponents don't know what you're doing. But then you'll slowly start to run out of cards. You can kind of guess ahead of time, like, okay, I've played, you know, I played my three move card. I know I, I no longer move three spaces. I've played one of my two move cards. I know I have a second one coming up later on a turn. So you can kind of plan ahead that way. Or you can go a little more chaotic in every turn where you shuffle them back in. It's a variant as well. Um, but I said all the characters play, have the exact same stuff, and they play the exact same way. Um, so there's no difference between which character you play as. Where the game gets different is upgrade cards. So there's this giant deck of upgrade cards. Every upgrade card is different, um, and they have costs associated with them. Some are permanent, some are temporary, and that's what will make everyone play differently. It's kind of like not quite a deck builder, because you buy it and then you can use it or not use it. Um, but it does definitely make everyone then have the option to play a little bit differently from turn to turn. Um, so, I'm going to kind of just do a quick glance through the rule book here. Um, so, setup is pretty easy. So, if we're going to flip back to the back of the book first. So, here's some of the setup guides. So, here's the starter course you would start at. So, you have a starting board here. Um, and players will place their robots on the white spots. Um, which would be where they start, and they're trying to just get to checkpoint one. So, not necessarily does this person have a better advantage than this person? Maybe, maybe not. Um, because they have conveyors that are coming back towards them, or one that's going to move them down, so they have to try and navigate around that. Um, where a guy down here could hit the one that moves them up, um, or he doesn't have to worry as much about going down. Uh, yeah, so there's some kind of different... In interesting things to go around um and then you can start up see some of the upgraded ones where now we have two boards or another single board for each one of these These are beginner courses um where this one only has two checkpoints so they have to race to this checkpoint and then they have to race back to this checkpoint this one has four so they'll be a little bit more clustered because you have to go around uh but then you can start expanding it to having multiple boards um, and they give you a bunch of different examples in here of stuff you can do. Like this one has three boards. Um, and then like we have like a later one. It's a longer game, which has four boards. And again, the more players you have, the longer the game's going to take. Because each player has to take five turns um, before each round. And then plus the bigger the boards, it's going to take longer to get across each board. So it's just different stuff to keep in mind. Um... You know, all this around. There's a bunch of different how to create your own boards. Um, and varying rules to play to make the game a little bit quicker. So they do have it just listed here as um, roughly broke up into three times. A short game is about 45 minutes. Medium is up to 75. And long is about 75 or longer. So an hour and a half or more. Um, it says the length of the race doesn't factor into the difficulty. Um... The number of boards, checkpoints, and factors most heavily into the playtime. So, they do have the difficulties listed, starter, beginner, enemy, and advanced. That's not necessarily how long it is. It's probably just more, there's more, more traps, more pitfalls. Maybe you have to move along more. Um, but the length has to just do with, if there's more boards, so far you have to travel. More players, more checkpoints, um, all that type of stuff. Plus, also depending on how long people spend taking their time to program and set up your five moves, you might want to set a time limit. Like um, some of the or earlier games, I think actually either people added them or it came with like a little hour, sand hourglass. Um, so people are spending 15 minutes deciding what to do. Um, but that's the, the basic gist of the game. It's fairly simple, I think, to pick up and learn. Um, but it will take a while to, like, kind of master what you need to do. Um, alright, so we're going to look at some of the different components, and then I will come back to the book if I need to. So, first up, we have our big player boards. Um, alright, so I'm going to get out here long enough. So, this is Twonky. Uh, he's the orange robot. 
So each robot will have a little miniature associated with them. They'll have a little arrow kind of pointing at the front, which is the direction they're facing. Uh, they're all pre-painted, which is really fun. Um, but again, they all play the same. So we have a draw deck, your discard pile for as you're going through your cards. You'll have your checkpoint counter, so you can keep track of uh, what checkpoint you're at. So then on your little tokens here, well, one for each color. So if you're playing four or up to six checkpoints, you can keep track of which checkpoint you're on. We also have energy cubes. So we get these little tiny energy cubes. Um, we'll keep track of how much energy you spend um, or have at a time. You can gain up to 10. These help you pay for your costs of your upgrades. And then you have spots one through five to replace your different uh, program cards. So it's fairly simple. Um, and at the top, we have installed cards. You can have up to three cards installed. Again, some are permanent, some are temporary. They will tell you on the card what they do and where they activate. Um, and on the back of each card, they do have a little uh, information about each character. But as of right now, again, like I said, they don't have any specific um, cards that separate them apart. We have a Spinbot, who's blue. So I'm just going to flip these over. Look at this side. We have Zoombot in green. So here is Zoombot. Big giant wheels. Looks like an engine. The Smashbot, which is yellow. Now, I really hope that at some point it would be cool if they added... Um, like specific cards for each character like one might do a little bit more damage cards or one might have an extra just to separate the main decks a little bit different that'd be kind of fun um there's Hammerbot. it's purple the red character is hulk x90 it's just a tank And then we did some Spinbot before, but we'll look at his miniature a little bit closer. And he's like a spinning bladed top. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then the other tokens we're going to get here. You're also going to get um, archive tokens. So these go where your character starts on the board. Um, just so you know what your starting position was. There are times when you might have to um, revert going back to that original spot. We have some respawn tokens, so if your character um, gets defeated um, or falls off the board or falls in a hole, um, this is where they'll respawn. Um, and the arrows on here are always very important because I always say what directional. And then the priority tokens, we know which player goes first each turn. Um, these are all just double-sided. So fairly, fairly simple. All right. Then let's take a look at the basic cards we have quick. I'm going to grab uh, We'll just throw this up here for the time being. So every character is going to have a deck of cards based on their color. So we have a yellow, we have a red deck. A blue deck, um, an orange deck, sorry, it's red. I'm wearing my colors there. Whoops. Um, the green deck, and of course, the purple deck, which is getting away from me. And we have the purple deck, which I have sleeved. Um, so in case you are interested in sleeving these cards, I have the Sleeve King Stanger US card size, uh, 67 to 87 millimeter is the kind I use. Um, they are also like Uno card size. So if like you have, um, like I have Ultimate Uno game, uh, like the Marvel and DC ones, they work for those as well. Uh, do you need to sleeve these? Probably, probably not. Um, but I like to sleeve all my cards just because you get people that come over, maybe that whatever on their fingers. It just helps protect them. Um, 
as well as the fact is I feel like because these programming cards, you're going to be shuffling constantly because you're going to keep going through all nine of them. Uh, or you draw nine every turn. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. There's only twenty of them. So you'll draw nine and nine and you'll have eighteen. Um, I'm sorry, you'll draw nine. I think then you draw back up to your hand size, if I remember right. I might have that wrong. Activation phase. Yeah, so at the beginning of the game, you draw nine cards. And then at the beginning of every turn, you will draw back up to nine cards. So there might be something that happens that makes you spend the extra card. Um, or so you might not have only four left in your hand. Um, but yeah, you can see definitely you'll be going through these cards fairly quickly. Um, so there. So what do we have here for what cards? We have, again, which... Um, Seems fairly explanatory. Uh, there was a page here that literally said exactly what you did. So again, you get one copy of this. It says, uh, repeat the previous program in your register if if it was that. Um, if it's your first card, discard it in your discard pile and replace it with the top card of your programming deck. So that's kind of random. Uh, but just as a way to let you use some of these cards, like a second time they maybe only have one copy of or you're running low on copies um it's actually very helpful we have um four copies of rotating left we have four copies of rotate right so your robot will always go whatever direction its little tiny arrow piece faces um so you have to rotate them left or right to decide if he needs to go up or down on the board or how which direction you need to go. There are things like gears and some of the conveyor belts that will also turn you as well, so you can use that to your advantage. Um, but they may also turn you the wrong direction. Um, for movement, we have four copies of moving forward, one space. We have three copies of moving forward, two spaces, and one copy of move forward, three space. Um, and then the last three cards, we can move back one space. We can power up, um, which lets you gain an energy cube. Um, the other way to do that is by landing on charging stations. So sometimes you might have to veer out of your way, um, towards the goal to land on a charging station to gain extra power so you can play upgrades. Um, and then the last one is U-turn, which turns you, uh, 180 degrees the opposite direction. So rather than having to turn left, turn left, you know, to turn around, this will go in one turn for you. Maybe you need to like, you ran up to grab an energy charge and then you need to turn back around. Uh, this is definitely a way to do that. Um, yeah, and those are the basic cards you will play every turn. Um, other than that, it's fairly, fairly simple on what you do. There are some different uh, spots on the boards that will, um, where did I put that? Right here. So the different spaces on the boards that will um, adjust what happens. We'll look at those. Oh, this does not want to stand on there. There we go. Um, and these are the ways they will activate. So after a robot activates, they flip over the first card. They do whatever it says. Um, let's look at the back of the card here. We actually have a couple of round sequences. So the round sequences are the order the game will be played. So we have the upgrade phase. Everyone performs it at the same time. Once during each upgrade phase, you may pay one energy to draw one new upgrade card. Once during each upgrade phase, you may install one new upgrade from your collection of uninstalled upgrades. Um, and you have to pay whatever the cost is. Some cost one, some cost two, three, four. Um, 
So everyone gets a chance to upgrade at the same time. And everyone gets to see the upgrades that are out there. So they know what their opponent can potentially do. There's different what they can do. Uh, then there's the programming phase. Everyone draws their cards until they have nine cards. Choose five, play them face down. Um, each of the five registers on the play mat. Ooh, the camera decided it wants, it wants to fall down. Um, I actually place any non damage programming cards you're still in your hand in a discard pile on your play mat. Um, choose five cards to play. Okay, and then place any non damage program cards in your hand, still in your discard pile. So there are damage cards, which I didn't go over yet. There are. Two sets of damage cards are Haywire and Spam. So these will come in, you will get these occasionally by taking damage from traps or other players, and then um, they will basically clog up your deck in your hand, and you have to play them to get rid of them. Um, so that might hinder your moves. So instead of getting five actions, you might get four actions because you have to play one of those. Uh, we'll take a look at those along with the upgrades in a minute here. In the activation phase, happens in priority. Each register activates slots one to five. All players will activate their robot turn to priority. So if there's three players, player one will go first. They'll, they'll, all three players will flip over their first register card, um, but player one will do their thing, then player two, then player three. Um, and then when next turn rolls around, then you get to register two, it'll be the same thing. Player one, player two, player three. Kill all, eventually all players are doing all five actions. Um, then when the next turn starts, the priority passes to player two. Then that entire next five registers will be player two, three, one, two, three, one. And then the third third round will be three, one, two, three, one, two. Um, it says once all players have completed a current register, the board elements, robot weapons, and end of register effects will be activated for the next round. So. There's a couple other little things in there. So after your, you do your register, then the board elements will activate. That's your different conveyor belts and your traps and stuff. Then robot weapons. And every robot attacks in whatever direction they're in, trying to hit another robot. Um, and well, I'll kind of put it on the board and I'll show you what that does. And that's how you, one of the different ways you can take damage. Um, and uh, step four is the end of the round where the fifth register is finally being resolved. Player holding the priority passes to their left. Place all face-up damage cards in your register into the damage discard. You, you've used them, you can get rid of them. Discard all face-up programming cards in your own discard pile. Leave all face-down cards in your register, if any. So if something places a card face-down, it stays in there. And then return to the upgrade base unless the race is ended. So pretty simple. Um, so how do things activate? They're going to activate in order. So one, two, three, four, five, and then we have robot set six and engine registration is seven and eight. So on the board, after everyone's played their first reg their first card and done either a move forward or a turn or you know move three spaces or whatever they do, they all the blue conveyor belts act. Um, so I'll be all these guys here, double symbols. Some have like turn arrows um, and things like that. It says any. Any robot standing then moves one space in the direction of the arrow. If a robot is still in a blue conveyor belt after a first conveyance, uh, it conveys a second time. Convey is just a different way to say move. So that basically means that if I'm on a double arrow when my robot moves, so I have him sitting here, he'll move one space, and then he'll move another space. Um, fairly simple. If they have an arrow like this, they will turn that direction. Um, so if my robot's facing these arrows and he's going this way, he'll move one. And when he goes this way, he'll turn that direction of the arrow like he's turning on the conveyor belt. Now, if he was facing the opposite direction, went one, and then two, he will still turn, but he'll turn at a 90 degree angle. So now he'll be backwards. And that'll be one, two, and he'll turn the same way. He'll keep moving around until he gets to the end of the board. So you get this one, and then this one. You always turn with the arrows. Um, they all the green ones activate. They just move one space. They only have one arrow. They only move you one direction. Um, 
and then you have push panels on here. So we have two different push panels, uh, a one, a three, and a five, and a two and a four. They will push you in that direction um, of the uh, uh, the border piece, the black piece, black and white, black and yellow piece, I guess. Um, one space away, but they only push on them certain registers. So if it is turn one and my robot moves here, he won't be pushed because it only activates on two and four. So he has another turn to potentially move. Um, but if it's turn two or four, it will shove him onto the conveyor belt. The same thing, this one will then have one, three, and five will shove him down. Uh, so that's, that all goes with planning, right? You got to plan around that stuff. Then we have gears, which are pretty simple. You land on a gear, rotates 90 degrees in the direction of the arrow. Um, so the idea is here, if your robot comes off of this, it will then now rotate you in the direction of the arrows. So now if I had a move right after this, it would move me down instead of the direction I was facing. Um, and the red arrows move one direction. I don't have a green on this board, but there are green ones that move the other direction. Um, and then finally on five, we have board lasers. Now, the expansions do add some other elements on the board, so they might add ones that take place at different intervals than these, and the instructions in there will tell you that. So once you buy expansions, you have to keep in track of the teleporter, um... Or, for example, like a water flow might interact in between or in front of one of these. Uh, board lasers fire but cannot fire through walls or hit more than one robot. They shoot from the pointer, so from the little uh, red and white part. Uh, they only hit the nearest source to the rod. Draw one damage one at a time for each laser beam showing. So, on here we have a laser beam that shows here. It's going to shoot all the way across until it finds a stopping point. So, they'll show the stopping points or where the lasers will shoot through. But what it will do is it will stop at the first robot it hits. So if, whoops, knocked my board down. So for this example, on this turn, this robot laser would fire, it would hit our yellow smash bot and it would ignore our red uh, tank bot back there. Um, it only hits the first guy it sees. Um, now, what could be bad is if this guy was standing here, because then he's going to get hit by both lasers. So that could definitely be a bad thing there. But all it would take is one guy to be standing in his way. He would take a hit from this laser, but he would take a hit from this laser. And no, so the lasers are just showing that that's where they're hitting from. Um, and then you draw a damage card. So that's one way you get damage. Then, right after that, is we have uh, robot weapons. Each la robot has a built-in mini laser Weapon that fires in the direction the robot is facing. The direction is based on its arrow base. Each range has no limits and goes until it hits a wall or a booth. So it works the same way as the board lasers. Um, just it is for these guys. So in this example here, is we have these two guys. So the yellow robot, if he had priority, would shoot straight down. Wouldn't do any damage to anybody. But the red one, because he's facing the yellow one, would now shoot the yellow robot. Very simple. If they're, for whatever reason, facing each other, then they each do a damage towards each other. Because they just shoot towards each other. If they're both facing this direction, they both shoot down, nothing would happen. Doesn't matter if they hit anything else, as they'll hit each other. So that can also make a difference on where you're positioning and how you do stuff there. Um, and the last two spots on the board are batteries. Um, you see one right there. Uh, if your robot ends its register on a battery, you gain one energy. Advance your energy cube up to one. So this is another way other than, um, gaining one at the beginning of your turn. You can gain energy that way. And then checkpoints. You must reach checkpoints in numerical order to win. If your robot ends on a register checkpoint, move its tracking number on your space. And then you know, so if there's only one flag, then you win when you hit you hit that first one. If there's three, you have to go to one, then to two, then to three. But you have to land on that space at the end of the turn. So that work could get a little bit tricky because um you know you might plan, hey, I'm gonna move three spaces and land on this, and then someone could push you up one space. Great. Now I have to move over three, but now I'm one space above it, right? So then your next turn, you have to spend 
one turn turning the direction and one turn moving down. Um, so it's two more registers to John. And it's two more chances that someone else can mess you up, right? So that's pretty cool. Uh, those are the different things. Um, other couple of rule things not pointed in there is there are some double triple lasers. So if you're on a triple one, you actually draw three damage cards. So those could be deadly as well. Um, Victor conveyor belts. If you move from a blue one into a green one, you move one, two spaces. And then the next time when the green activates, you move again for green. But not vice versa. If you move from green to blue, nothing would happen until the next round when the blue ones activate. Um, there's one of our green ones. Uh, we do have pits and edge of the boards. Um, our game just move up, moves into a pit or gets pushed off. Um, it must be put to start on the next round. Um, edge of the board is not considered a pit even though it has a similar effect. So if something specifies a pit, the edge of the board does not count as a pit. Um, so how do we do reboots? We have reboot tokens that were falling off the board or a pit reappeared during register one during the next round. Each board only have one of these tokens. Um, robot tokens should not, not obstruct movement or lasers if there are walls or space um, in a place that you allow it. So basically just put it on there, on that spot at the beginning of the next round. That's where they respawn at. Uh, there are walls that will block you, stop your robot from moving, or block lasers. Fairly simple there. Um, so we do have the ability to, uh, if a conveyor would push you into another robot, you just stop. You don't move any farther. Uh, if, like, two would end up in the same spot, neither of them occupy that space. Uh, fairly simple there. Um... I think that was it for that. So I do have, just to point out, the rotating. This is a good instruction book for this. Um, for showing how these work. So this robot moved back onto a conveyor belt. Um, so when you got here, it's going to rotate him the one direction. It's going to rotate him that way. So it puts him face down. And just the other one, it'll rotate him back that way. It'll put him back the way he was before. Um... But if you move on to a spot that has a rotating arrow, you do not rotate. You only rotate if um, if you move into that spot. Um, also, a robot is on a conjunction space between a curved arrow. It only rotates 90 if it came from the direction of the curved arrow. So it's showing down here. It went straight, straight. Because it's a straight arrow into like a straight arrow, it doesn't change. It only changes if it goes into that one that shows that turning space. Um, so that's fairly simple there. Uh, I think that is the main part of the rules, except for pushing. Um, your robot moves into another row space, or typically uh, when moving a space for failure and instruction, uh, it is considered a push. Um, so what happens here is a yellow bot, smash bot, needs to move one. He's going to push both guys over. Um, here, if he needs to move three spaces, he's going to push him one space over. Two spaces over, they're going to stop because they hit a wall. Or that last space is removed. But you can push guys around, which is going to definitely mess up how they do stuff. Um, all right. So then we have some damage cards. I want to take the damage cards before I get into the reboot cards or the upgrade cards. So we have this giant pile of spam cards. Just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Twenty-three spam cards. Spam cards say place this card into the damage uh, discard pile and replace it with the top card of your programming deck. So. Either this card sits in your hand and doesn't do anything, um, and then you don't discard it and you're going to keep it in there. It's going to clog your actions up, or you have to play it. When you play it, though, it's going to at least do something because it's going to replace your top card of your programming deck, but it could definitely mess you up. You, um, you have move one, turn left, move two, and then you play a spam card. 
that spam card could do a U-turn, or it could be turn right and undo what you just did, uh, or spin you the wrong direction, or it could move you three spaces and be helpful. You you don't know, but it's kind of crazy. But it's kind of crazy. Then the other ones are haywires, which there are seventeen of, um, and haywires have. <coughs> excuse me have different effects for each card. So this one's gonna say move one, then take the priority token. Do not move the priority token at the end of this round. Uh, move five if you hit a wall. This register, take one damage. Move back three. Move two, rotate left. Move two, rotate right. Move one, rotate left, move one. Move one, rotate right, and then move one. Move three, and then do a U-turn. Move two, uh, left or right without changing facing. Draw, draw and reveal top two cards your program deck resolve both in order of your choosing. Move one, your robot's main laser deals an additional damage as register. Rotate left or rotate right. Uh, move back one, move a card from your discard pile from the game. Install a permanent upgrade from your collection of uninstalled upgrades. At the end of the round, place a card in the upgrade discard pile. Uh, pay 0 to 8 energy, then move 2 spaces for each energy you paid. Uh, rotate, get any facing, move 1, and move 1 back and you turn. So yeah, a bunch of different things that could happen in there. Basically, you either again, these are going to clog your hand up and let you draw less cards because you're not going to have as many, or you're going to play them to get rid of them. Um, but they can have lots of messed up effects. They could work towards your advantage as well. Um, all right, so before we get into the upgrade cards, let's look at the boards. All right, to start every game, you will have Docking Bay, your Docking Bay, which would be either Docking Bay A or Docking Bay B, which will separate them by walls. So, like, whoever starts in each area can't like move over into the other area the other robots but it'll just give you some different advantages um not too much different either all on a straight line or some that just start back a little bit farther now in some of the books they do have extra energy cubes put on there to show like which spots can't be activated from the start of the game um and that's just to like so that way you might be like hey this giant board you can only start on this half or you can't use these particular spots at the start you know so it can give some different options um one of the later expansions is going to add um i know will add a second different docking station um then all the boards do have names we have misdirection um so this has a lot going on um and that's just definitely gonna make these, some of these boards a little bit crazier than others this is gonna have Gears are going to turn you into different conveyor belts. This conveyor belt is going to drop you into a pit. Um, some of these will push you into lasers. Um, run you off the board if you're not careful. Unless there's another thing there. So a lot of different stuff going on. Just some circles here. Um, might be very tough to navigate. Um, on the flip side, we have a very a little bit simpler board. We have Energize. This has a lot more batteries, so you play more upgrade cards. But you have a little bit more walls and gears, lasers, pits. A couple other different things to avoid, but no conveyor belts. Kind of fun to not have any with conveyor belts. Just so it's not only conveyor belt. We have Steps. Um... I love that they're not asymmetrical boards either. That shit's really fun. Uh, but you can see this is going to kind of like lead you down to this way. And then if you follow all the way through and somehow get through, it's going to lead you back out the other side. This one's kind of the same way. Lead you into here. Could shove you into that side or could bring you back around this way and kick you off this direction. Um, then the outside belts kind of keep you in there. So yeah, very interesting there. And on the other side, we have the in and out board. Uh, just a lot of big conveyor belts that, you know, pull you into the board and then shove you back out or shove you out on a different side. The blue ones kind of rotate you around. Green ones get you through. Could be a great way to get to another board um, or get you back off the board. We have board number three. We have Tempest. 
um, lot of green conveyor belts um, going one direction up this way, the other one's coming back down. Um, some pushers, some late, not too many lasers, but um, some other different stuff, some charging stations. A little bit chaotic. On the other side, we have a little bit simpler one, the Keep. Um, just some green ones on the outside. Probably try and get you into the inside. Then you have to try and deal with that blue conveyor belt, which could put you wherever. Because, um, you know, you might want to be like, I need to get off here so I don't land on one of these and get shoved around or get shoved back onto the board. Um, yeah, so trying to program while moving across that conveyor belt could be very tricky. Plus, you have to worry about all of a sudden you're like, oh, move three. And then, oh, I moved into a wall, right? Could be very interesting. And then the last board is Cactus. Um, not really sure why it's Cactus, but this kind of gives you a walk all the way around blue, up into green, up into a blue, and then it goes the other direction, green, into blue, into green, and then they kind of like get to that center point and they're going to rotate you back around. I guess it kind of looks like a Cactus. Um, but yeah could be very interesting to deal with. And then the last one is the Sidewinder. Um, fairly easy, just a very long blue conveyor belt into a green one, which you could get lucky and get here and maybe step like two over and get over quicker, but the walls might get in your way. Um, or you can always opt to go, try and go around. You know, different directions there. So they'll add up to different boards, which you have different different locations, different ways like that. Um, could be fun. Again, they're gonna they have expansions. They're gonna add a bunch of more different tiles and stuff. Um, and one of the ones that is coming out is called Master Builder, which will actually add um, actually add a bunch of like smaller tiles and tokens, so you can really customize your boards even more, which would be really fun. Um, all right, so here are upgrades. I love the fact that all of the upgrades are different. That was one of my favorite things of, of looking over this. Um, they could have had it been like, well, there's three of this one, three of this one, three of this one. Um, but since every single one is completely different, it gives you a lot of options. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, And there's 40 different ones. Each expansion pack has been adding five. So I think currently right now they have four total plants. That's another 20 cards. It brings up to 60 different upgrade cards. So let's go ahead and just take a look at what all these do. Um, I have not actually read through any of these. So this is going to be interesting to see what they do is for me as well. Um, cost at the top. Um, and then whether it's temporary or yellow ones will be permanent. I'm not gonna reread all that every time, but we have a board switch. Replace a registry, register card you just revealed with the top card of your programming deck. Um, cool, so you did change what you're doing. All aboard, movement upgrade. Activate all conveyor belts, but only for your robot. Blue conveyors first, then green conveyors. Oh, that's cool. Um, in case your robot gets a boost. Bonk. Upgrade. Movement upgrade. Move to an unoccupied adjacent space without changing facing. Break. You move one car in your register. What move? One card in your registers may be treated as move zero. Oh, that's fun. So that, that's a good way. So this is cool. Because it's going to definitely change up how the game is played. So now you can also, now you have four extra cards in your deck to give you different movement options. Um, calibration protocol. Return all damage cards in your hand to the damage discard pile, then draw that many cards from your programming deck. Nice. Chaos theory. When you reveal a spam and register one, two, or three, gain one energy. So this could help you if you are uh, gaining a lot of spam cards. Crab legs. You may place one move card in the same registry as rotate left or rotate right during that register. Your robot will move one space to the left or the right, respectively, without rotating. Cool. 
um, she gives you a little side shuffle. Deflector shield, when a robot would take damage from lasers, and or other weapons, you may pay one energy to take no laser weapon damage during this register. Displacing Blast. Instead of firing a robot's main laser, you may fire a Displacing Blast. If you do relocate the target of the robot to the reboot token of the board and occupy without changing their direction. Oh, that could be very mean. Um, double Barrel Laser. Your robot's main laser deals an additional one damage to robots. Drifting. After resolving a rotate left, you may move one space forward. So that costs four. It's going to cost a lot, but it's going to make your, your rotating left permanently do an extra thing. Um, although, remember, you can only have three permanents out at a time. So you might have to get rid of some depending on what you want. Energy conversion. After your robot takes damage from a board laser, you may move one space forward or backwards. Firewall. You do not draw any damage from cards when rebooting after... Any damage cards when rebooting after falling into a pit. Uh, flash Drive. Draw one additional program card at the start of each phase. Uh, hover Unit. Robots can pass over picks during your programming card activation, but it falls in if it ends its move on one. Ooh, that's kind of risky. Uh, laser Kata. After performing a U-turn, your robot fires its main laser in all four directions during its robot activation phase. Ooh, that could be fun. Um, Lucky Booster. Reveal and discard cards from your damage deck until you reveal a Haywire. You may replace a register card you just revealed with damage or discard it to the damage discard. Magnetic. When a Jason robot moves via a register card, you may move with them. Ha, that's fun. Uh, memory cards. At the end of the programming phase, you may place any number of non damage cards. From your hand into this card. At the start of the upgrade phase, add all cards to your hand. Oh, okay, cool. So basically what you can do is after you've programmed your five cards, you can set extra cards you have to then you'll be able to use on the next turn. Cool. Uh, memory swap. Draw three cards from your program deck, then choose three cards from your hand to put on top of your deck in any order you choose. Uh, mini Howitzer. Instead of firing your robot's main laser, you may pay one energy to fire the Mini Howitzer. If you do, deal two damage to the target robot, then push it one space in the direction of fire. Modular Chassis. After your robot pushes another robot during your programming card activation, you may give that player this card, then take one of their installed upgrades, both are immediately installed and activated. Overclock. Movement. Upgrade. Move 2. Interesting. It's just a free extra move. Uh, piercing Drill. When your robot pushes another robot during your programming card activation, they take 1 damage and you may rotate them facing any direction. Power Slide. After resolving Rotate Right, you may move 1 space forward. Presser Beam. Instead of firing a robot's main laser, you may fire a Presser Beam. If you do, the target robot... Push the target robot one space away from your robot. Uh, pressure release. Movement upgrade. Move back five spaces, but stop before a robot would push another robot. Railgun. Uh, your robot's main laser may shoot through any number of walls and or robots. Each robot hit takes one damage. Ooh, that's fun. Ramming gear. During activation, during your program card activation, if your robot pushes or attempts to push an adjacent robot, takes one damage. Reinitialize. Give priority token to any player on the table, including yourself. Rear laser. Your robot has a rear firing laser in addition to its main laser. Both fire simultaneously. Recharge. Gain three energy. Rewire. Play only during the upgrade phase. Add all face down haywire cards in your registry to your hand. You must program all these haywires this round, but you may replace them where you wish. Interesting. Um, 
Scrambler. Instead of firing robots, main laser, you may fire Scrambler. If you do replace the target's next registry, top card from the programming deck cannot be used during register 5. Self diagnostics. When your robot reaches a new checkpoint, you may remove a card in your hand or discard pile from the game. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. Um, spam filter. After refilling your hang, the start of the programming phase, flip the top card of your programming deck face up. Spiky. When an adjacent robot moves into your robot space or is pushed into your robot space, that robot takes one damage. Switch. Movement upgrade. Swap place with an adjacent robot without changing facings. Tractor beam. Instead of fire robot's main laser, you may fire a tractor beam. If you do, pull the target robot one space towards you to not be used on adjacent robots. And finally, Zoop. Uh, movement upgrade, rotate to face any direction. Cool. Alright, so that's all of the different cards we have. Um, so the last, one of the last two things I want to look at quick is just alternate rules for the game. Um, and then I want to show off some of the box stuff. So on the back here, we have a couple of just a quick... Variant rules, it might be interesting. Um, so the other game includes um, beginners, younger players, or players who don't want to keep track of things. You can eliminate all upgrades from the game. Um, so you just don't use upgrade cards. Um, and the battery space is doing nothing. Don't keep track of energy. So that could be just a quick way or maybe an early game. Just get used to the programming mechanics. Add the uh, upgrades later. For a less deadly game, um, all players should play without falling off the board rules. Um, since they're all map edges that don't have boards to be invisible walls. So that could just be a little bit easier way so you don't have to worry about that. Less spammy game. Um, reduce the randomness and the time to play. Players should discard all spam cards in their hand at the end of their phase. Discard your spam in your discard pile. You can need to draw spam from your deck, uh, but you'll draw your other cards more often this way. This is so you still have, you can still use the spam, but instead of having them clog up your hand or deciding to use them, you can basically just treat them as, um, instead of having to ever play them, you just treat them as ways that are gonna clog up your hand during your turn. Since you'll have nine cards and you have two spams, now you'll have seven cards to choose from. Um, you can just get rid of them that way. Um, dynamic archiving. Instead of placing reboot tokens on each board, robots archive when they end a register a checkpoint or a battery space. You place your robot's archive token on that space. If your robot must reboot, they do set their archive space. Um, so the idea of this is, so instead of always everyone rebooting at that one space, your characters will reboot at different spaces around the board. Um, so it kind of just changes up the game a little bit. Uh, so it's kind of neat, because then you like, it gives you more maybe an incentive to hit a battery because now you can like maybe be a little bit closer to a checkpoint in case you fall off. Um, competitive mode, uh, after set up the race course and determining first player priority, each player may place their energy tracking cube on one of the docking spaces. Um, so it's basically just lets you kind of like, if you know where the advantage might be, you can block where someone else can play. Very, you know, it's very interesting, just a little bit different way. The act fast mode, which I mentioned earlier, is kind of setting a timer um, just for players playing their hands so that they're not taking forever to, you know, min max and everything, being like, okay, if I move one here, if I do turn left, move this. Because of the fact is, other things are probably going to mess you up. Um, you don't want people like spending 10 minutes deciding what to do on each turn. Play it, play it quick, make it fast, you know. Um, and then less foreshadowing. Um, at the end of each round, players shuffle cards in their deck, discard pile, and non damage cards in your hand together to form a new pro programming deck. Just keep each hand of cards random so be able to have a pretty good idea of what's coming up. So this again, like I said earlier, would be, you know you only have one move card, one U-turn, um, one move back card. If you've already played them, you know you're not going to run into them again. So you can kind of plan your later turns knowing, okay, I am down to the point where on my next hand, I'm gonna draw uh, my my three and my move two so I can kind of plan ahead for that. Or if you have to shuffle everything every time, you have no idea what you're gonna get every time. You could get good luck and keep getting your move three several times in a row, but you might also have getting, you may have to keep missing that every time because you're reshuffling. So it's a little bit, um, 
a little bit here and there gimmick on what could happen. All right, last thing I want to do is show off the box. All right, I don't often show off boxes, but I just want to just point this out. It's one thing I did like to do. So they do have all the different spots for the robots here, which is which is definitely great. Um, and then even down here, then they have a spot for each different deck. I have like this one sleeve down here. Still fits in there uh, very nicely. A little bit tighter than that, but, you know, it's not bad. The only downside would be is it sticks up over the top a little bit more than the regular cards do. But once you do all of them that way, it, like, it'll still be fairly flat. But I like the fact that then, you now if I want to just play, oh, I'm going to grab my blue character, I can grab my blue deck. I want my red one, I got my red deck. You can put them right back fairly quickly. Um, and then they have two spots. Ooh, I keep kind of backing away. We have two spots here for our damage cards. And our upgrade cards just definitely look like as I sweep them, I'm gonna have room. There's plus extra room in there. So obviously like you're gonna add more cards. You can add more in here. Worst case is though, if you ever had to, you could always put them in these slots here as well. Um, only thing is, is it looks like they're not gonna fit a hundred percent sweeved in there. So that's gonna be the only problem you're gonna run into if you try and throw them in these spots. But that's at least an option. Uh, and then that little tray down here for your flags, um, plus some badges that came with to put in your cubes and your other tokens. Uh, you can always just drop all your robots in there too if you don't want to try and figure out which spot they go in. Um, so I think it's nice because it looks like there's going to be enough room for like a couple of upgrades in here um, over time. Um, although if they ever add more robots and stuff, now you're, then you're dead. You're just have to dump them in there, but that's not that big of a deal. Then comes the other part of all your boards and stuff. So you can lay your character boards in there, rule board, got our regular rule book, drop your, uh, docking bay there, and then we grab our four boards, we throw them in there, they're going to fit. Now... Um, this is the only thing I had to say about this for the upgrade thing, is because, although it's going to fit the extra cards in there, I don't have a lot of extra room in here, and as I squeeze them, cards is going to lift them up just a little bit more, so, um, you might be able to fit, like, the first expansion in here, especially if you don't squeeze your cards, I feel like after that, though, like, each one, I think, has three, three boards, so, between three two or three expansions, you have six, 12, 12 boards, um, you're not gonna have enough room in here anymore. So you'll have to find a different solution for that. So that's just something I did wanna point out. There is enough room for the base game to hold everything, possibly the first expansion. Um, after that, you'll have to find something else, at least for the boards. If you just find a different box to hold all the boards in, great. Um, the master builder set that's coming out will have another full box so that might just be a good substitute just take a, like whatever storage has in there maybe they have enough space in there to put all the boards we'll have to see when that comes out later this year i'll do a revisit um the regular expansions though basically just come wrapped as boards so there's no like box to put them in um all right that's what we have for this uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. A little bit longer video. I tried to just make sure I went over all the different details of the game. Uh, definitely seemed really fun. Um, come back, check out. We'll do the uh, first two sets of unboxings, uh, expansions together. Then when the second two come out later on this year, I'll definitely do them as well. See you guys later. Bye.